so here's a, a question for you to think about. <clears throat> have you ever made a bad trade? I mean, if you stop and think about it, probably all of us have done that. Uh, our kids, some of our kids are at the age where like trading lunch items in the cafeteria is like a pretty hot deal right now. Uh, you don't want to trade with my children. Because uh, especially on, I remember for April Fool's Day, they, they all got a bunch of Oreos and like pulled the top off, hollowed out the middle of the cream and replaced it with mayonnaise and toothpaste. And then they traded those to somebody, right? Like, so somebody was on the wrong end of the trade that day. Uh, or maybe you traded some cash for a used car at some point and you ended up getting a lemon. I, I remember when I was a kid, there was a season where I was like really into baseball cards for a little while. And one of my friends had this car that I was just convinced was super valuable. So I was going to trade him my skateboard for a baseball card. And my dad, I think knowing that this card was not worth what I thought it was, was trying to talk me out of it. And I was just, I was set on this. So I think eventually he realized, like, you know, he's 13 years old. At some point he's got to learn, you know, the consequences of his own decision. So he let me do it. And sure enough, like, I end up without a skateboard and with this piece of paper that is basically worthless, right? I mean, sometimes we just make bad trades. So I, I want you to keep that idea about bad trades in mind because we're going to circle back to it in a little while. Um, but this morning we are starting a short sermon series where we are talking about a fairly sensitive subject, right, politics. Now, I don't know about you all, but I grew up in the South, and I was taught from a very early age that there are three things you do not talk about in polite company, right? You don't talk about religion, you don't talk about money, and you sure don't talk about politics. Well, we're a church, so it's pretty hard not to talk about religion here. And Jesus talks about money quite a bit, so we talk about money here as well. But it's pretty easy not to talk about politics. And in fact, sometimes that's the safest thing to do because politics is such an incredibly divisive issue in our world today. Uh, but over the last few months, as I've been thinking and praying about this, I, I really have felt prompted by the Holy Spirit to address this and to address it for a couple of reasons. Uh, first, I think the role of evangelical Christians and, and how they vote in the election coming up it is going to be more and more part of our national conversation this year than it was even four years ago, right? I mean, you already hear stories about that. People are talking about the evangelicals and they vote, and what about this, and what about that? And I just think, okay, if the world is talking about it, then we as a church should be talking about this too, if they're going to be talking about it. Um, but the other one, reason that I really wanted to talk about this is just I have been growing increasingly concerned that the way that Christians engage in politics this year has the potential to damage the reputation of Jesus, and it has the potential to damage our relationships with each other. And it has the potential to damage the way that we can witness about Jesus and tell other people in the world about him. And those things, like taking care of those things, that's our job. That's pretty high on my job description as a pastor. So I feel like that these are issues that we really do need to weigh into. And sort of a guiding thought for me as I've been thinking about this and wondering what to talk about, praying about what to talk about in the series, has been the following. Um, so think about it this way. So our preferred candidate, whoever our preferred candidate is, is going to win or lose based on how hundreds of millions of Americans vote in early November. But the reputation of Jesus will win or lose based on our personal behavior between now and then. Now really, I think that's true, right? Our candidate is going to win or lose. It's not just up to our vote. It's, it's how all Americans vote on that Tuesday in November. But the reputation of Jesus Christ can win or lose based on what we as individuals, what we as a church, what we do between now and then. And that may seem like a strong statement, um, but the words of Jesus really back this up. Like, so something that Jesus said 2,000 years ago, I think speaks very directly to the political moment that we're in right now. And it also gives us wisdom on what it means to faithfully follow Jesus in the midst of what I think is going to be a very, very nasty election year. So to get into that, I'd love to invite you to turn with me in the Bible to John 17. Uh, if it would have helped for any reason, you can grab a red Bible from those seats in front of you and turn to the page number that's there on the screen. But just a couple, of, a couple of disclaimers as we get started. Some of you guys are looking a little bit nervous, okay? So first off, this series is not about policies. It's not about platforms. It's not about individual candidates. It's not about issues. Uh, I'm not going to try to tell you how to vote. I'm not going to talk about specific platforms or try to convince you to change parties. All right, right? Some people, when they, they came in and saw that bulletin cover this morning, they were pumped, man. They were ready to talk about this. And other people, as they're looking at that, and like Susie prays for Grace City, they're like, is it too late to get to one of Grace City services today? Um, it's not. I think they meet at like 1030 or 11 down at the White Side downtown if you want to head down there. Um, but here's the deal. Instead, all I want to do in this series is do what we do every single week, which is go back to the words of Scripture 
and say, okay, how should this impact the way we think and how we live in the world? As opposed to the things that we hear on the news, the, con- the, politi- the political, cultural conversation about us. Let's go back to scripture and say, okay, what wisdom does that have for how we as followers of Jesus should engage in this political season? Now, having said that, having put you at ease, uh, I do need to warn you. Like, it is very likely that Jesus is going to step on every single one of our toes during this series, no matter where you land on the political spectrum. And and do you know why that is? It's because of something that a pastor named Tony Evans said once. Uh, He said that Jesus did not come to take sides. He came to take over. Okay? Jesus didn't come to take sides. He came to take over. He did not come to throw his support behind any existing group or political party. Jesus came to establish the kingdom of God, right? And he's ruling that thing, right? Because he's the king. That raises a question for all of us today. Will we continue to follow our king Jesus when following Jesus creates space between us and our political party or between us and our party's platform or us and our party's candidate? Um, That can be hard to do. I think it's increasingly hard to do in the political climate that we're in today. But it is something that our King Jesus very clearly calls us to do. Because he did not come to side with any political party. He came so that people of every political party would bow the knee to him and find their place in his kingdom. So, you guys all still with me? Boy, in the first service at this point, I was like, I'm really glad we don't let people have food in the sanctuary because this is you know, dodging stuff. But anyway, nobody threw anything. It, it, they were very polite. So here's, here's how I want to get into this today. Um, I think when I look at our church at Suburban and what we are going to experience as we move towards the election this year, I think the single greatest concern that I have is that we as a church are set up to be divided. Okay, we're set up to be divided. And let me, let me tell you what I mean by that. My, my history, my time here at Suburban actually kind of lines up with the 2016 election in a weird way. So I, I got voted on as Suburban's new pastor in October of 2016. Um, but we didn't move the family out until Christmas because, you know, the kids were in school out there. But I came out here in early November for a couple of weeks just to, to sort of meet people and get started. So, and that was when the election happened. So I remember, literally, I was standing right here the Sunday after the election. And I look out at the, the crowd that day. And about half of us were so excited. Man, they were over the moon. We were singing. We were singing loud. I mean, it's like there was a promise and the future was looking bright. And about half the people in the room looked like the world had ended. And they were just distraught. I mean, they they looked scared. They just were were shell-shocked almost. And now, you may not know this about Suburban, because I don't know who all you know and, and connect with here. But as a church, we are very politically diverse. Right? There are people here who truly and deeply love Jesus, who are on pretty much any side you can imagine. Republican and Democrat for sure, but we've got people here who are independent and libertarian. We've probably got some Green Party people and some people who don't have a political affiliation. But this idea of maintaining our unity in spite of our diversity, that is at the very heart of Suburban's identity, and it always has been. Right? While we may have different political views, or we might even differ on some points of interpreting the Bible, our goal has always been to major in the majors. Our goal is to be connected and united over these major, core, non-negotiable things that unite us. And we do that. As we do it, we want to t- maintain unity within our church in spite of our diversity. And we want to maintain unity with other churches so that we can be effective in our witness to the world and to the community around us. So I think there's, there's real benefits to the, the political diversity that we have here as a church, but it really does mean in this year that we're going to have to work to preserve our unity because absolutely everything in the political discussion going on in our world today is designed to divide people. It's de- designed to sort of attack unity. It's designed to, to break people up into camps so that our side can hopefully beat their side in November. And you know what the single biggest thing driving that is? It's fear. It absolutely is fear. You guys may have noticed, have you ever noticed that fear is an incredibly effective way to raise money? Really? I mean, just think about it. Republicans, the Democrats are coming for your guns. But for a gift of $50 to our political action committee, we can stop this injustice. Right? Democrats, the Republicans, want to take away your health care. But for $25 to candidate X, we can make sure that that never happens. Uh, You know, citizens of Earth, neither one of the parties cares about the planet, but if you donate to the Green Party, we will make sure. I mean, you see it everywhere, right? And if you don't believe me, go on social media any day, anywhere, right? Because every political strategist out there knows that fear is the very best way to get people to dig deep and give up some money. And it also is an incredibly effective tool to divide people and move them into different parties. But this is where we have a difference as followers of Jesus, 
Do you know what the single most often repeated command in the entire Bible is? Fear not. Right? Fear not. It's mentioned over 300 times in the Bible. Over and over again, it says, fear should not motivate what we do. Now, that doesn't mean that the stakes aren't high. It doesn't mean that the issues that were being debated in this election cycle aren't really important. They are. And as followers of Jesus, we should engage in those issues as God leads us. But as followers of Jesus, we should also be very aware. We need to be smarter than the average bear out there, right? And more mature and just realize, okay, the political conversation around us today is intentionally trying to stoke up fear and use fear to try to separate us and destroy our unity, even our unity in the church. And that word, unity, that was a big deal to Jesus. So it should be a big deal to us as well. Because Jesus knew, he knew that when his followers were able to love each other and to stay unified around him in spite of their differences, that communicated something powerful to the world. So that's, that's what Jesus is getting at in this passage that I had you turn to in John 17. So let, let me set this up. In this passage, this is it's the last night of Jesus' life on earth. Right? He knows that at the end of this night, he's going to be arrested. That's going to lead to his execution. So he's having a final meal with his closest friends, his disciples, his followers. And for like four or five chapters, he teaches them. It's like Jesus' greatest hits, right? He knows that this is his last time to be with them, so he's teaching them these incredible things. But at the beginning of chapter 17, he decides to stop teaching them And he does something a little different. He begins to pray for them, right? So that's where we pick this up in verse 1. It says, after that, Jesus said this, all these teachings that he'd given them. He looked toward heaven and he prayed. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you, right? Jesus has just finished all this teaching and he's starting to pray. And he says, God, okay, the time has come, right? The, The hour is drawing near. My time with these guys is almost over. And then he talks some about what he's been teaching them over the years. And and in verse 6, he he goes more of that. He says, I revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. He's talking about his disciples. They were yours. You gave them to me, and and, uh, they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you've given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew with certainty that I came from you, and they believe that you sent me. So he's saying, Jesus, these folks that you brought into my camp, right, I've been telling them about you. I've been telling them about the kingdom. I've invited them to come in and to play a part in it. And then Jesus has a prayer request for them. You guys remember Sunday school? You know, it's like, does anybody have a prayer request? So this is Jesus has got a prayer request. He says, I'm getting ready to leave this world, and they're going to still be down here, and they're going to be in charge of carrying on this mission that I'm leaving them. God, I've got one thing I want to ask you for. So look what he says at the end of verse 11. He says, Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one, right? He's asking God to protect them, but he's doing it for a specific reason. You see that little phrase in there, so that? If you're ever reading the Bible and you come across that phrase, so that, like alarm bells should be going off for you. Because so that is a phrase that the the author puts in intentionally to try to like wave their arms and say, hey, what I'm about to say, this is really important. What's coming next? This is a big deal. You need to look at this. And Jesus says that in his prayer. And what comes next after he says, so that? Why does he want them to be protected? He asked that God would protect them so that they would be one, right? Just as he and the Father are one. This is a prayer for unity. It's a request that they would stay united, joined together in their common mission and purpose and by the shared grace that they had received from God. He's praying that what they have in common as disciples of Jesus would be stronger and would keep them together when there's so many other things in their life that might have threatened to divide them or separate them. I mean, isn't that remarkable? This is the very last thing that Jesus asked the Father to do for his disciples. This is what he is thinking about as he is approaching his own death, their unity, their unity above all else, because he knew that something powerful could happen when his followers stayed united. And as if all that isn't enough, that's great stuff in there. But this passage gets even better. Like what comes next? This is one of my very favorite parts of the whole Bible. It should absolutely be one of your favorite parts of the Bible too. And let me tell you why. It's because in the next few verses, it is the one time in the Bible where Jesus prays specifically for me. And he prays specifically for you, right? He prays specifically for every single person who would ever follow him, right? From from the people in the first century that did that right up to those of us who follow him today. And does anybody want to guess what his one big prayer request is for you and me today? 
This is actually when you can guess if you want to. It's not a trick question, right? It's unity, right? He wants the same thing for us that he wanted for them. So look what he says in verse 20, right? He's been praying for the, the disciples as a whole, and then he sort of shifts his attention forward into the future. He says, God, my prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message. That's us. That's all of us. We're in that line. He says that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. Now, I think when Jesus was praying this, right, he's looking ahead, and he knew what his church was going to become. He knew that at this point, right, it's just a handful of these Jewish guys in first century Palestine. But he knew that as unlikely as it seemed, that was going to be the birth of a movement that was going to grow and was going to spread and would get to the point where it involved people of every nation, every language, every skin color, every ideology, every political party, every socioeconomic background. As hard as it is, Jesus is looking into the future and he is envisioning a day where the kingdom of God includes both beavers and ducks. And again, it's hard for us to believe how some of those people could be here, but apparently they are. And, and it's crazy, right? And the one thing, the one thing that he prays for this incredibly diverse group that's going to come out of his movement is that they would be one. That their shared experience of grace would not be able to overcome all of the things that might naturally divide them. But here's the deal, that, that's not all. Like, because you keep going, it keeps getting better. You know what, Jesus, he's so crafty. You know what he slips into this prayer? He slips in another one of those little so that statements. So look what he says. He continues to pray and he says, may they also be in us so that the world may believe that you sent me. He says, I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one, I and them and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then, get this, then the world will know that you sent me and that you have loved them even as you loved me. Did you see that? Father, help them be unified so that the world may believe that you sent me so that the world will know that you love them. I mean, this is so, so, so important. We cannot miss this, right? Jesus prays for our unity, not just for our own sake, although there's real benefits to that. He prays for our unity for the sake of the mission that he has given us. He prays that we will all be one so that when the world sees our unity in spite of the differences that we have, they're going to realize that something is different about us and they're going to want to know more. Jesus says that doing that, staying unified, it's just, it's mission critical, right? Loving one another, even if we don't think like one another, can change the world. And that, sort of that prayer, thinking about doing that, like that, that may seem like a really tough task in today's political climate. Um, but what we can take confidence in is we can look at the history of the church and realize God answered this prayer for Jesus in the first century. Because I mean, really, you think we're divided as a country right now? I got to tell you, we don't hold a candle to first century Israel, right? I mean, think about that, right? So first century Israel, the Roman army has occupied the land. The empire is in charge. A lot of diversity is how people responded to that, right? So you have some people like the zealots who are, are literally arming themselves, right? They're making swords. They're training for war. They're going out. They would occasionally ambush Roman soldiers and kill them, right? So that's one way to respond. And then over here, you've got these other people that are, that are actively collaborating with the Romans, right? They're trying to keep the Romans in charge, keep the Romans ruling their land. Like, there's some just real different approaches to the political situation that day. And the crazy thing about that is you have that same diversity of political expression in Jesus' group of disciples. Okay, think about who was in that original group with them. One of those guys is Simon the Zealot, right? So Simon is part of this zealous, this rebellious, revolutionary band, right? He's training for war. He's probably, I don't know, maybe he's killed Roman soldiers when he had an opportunity. So he's one of the guys in the group. And guess who's sitting across from him at the dinner table? Right, it's Matthew. Does anybody remember what Matthew's job was before he joined up with Jesus? He was a tax collector. He worked for the empire. His job was to take money from other Jewish people and give it to the Romans so the Romans could continue to afford to be in charge of his land. Now listen, you think your dinner table Christmas conversations during the impeachment season with your family were awkward? They cannot hold a candle. I mean, I just like to imagine, what were the conversations between Simeon and Matthew like around the campfire all those nights with Jesus? It just had been so much more intense than what we would have today, right? And yet, in spite of that, in spite of all of the things that could have divided them, God answered Jesus' prayer, right? You see it in the book of Acts. The book of Acts tells the history of the early Christian movement. And what it talks about over and over again is how this group stayed united, and it ended up changing the world, right? So Acts points out to us that this group, they were one in heart and mind. 
Other passages talk about how they were, they were so unified in their purpose and in their worship of God and their connection that they were actually willing to, to sell the things they had and give it to others as they had need. They made such an incredible community that was united in spite of their differences that when the rest of the people in the world saw that, it said that the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Right? That picture, that picture of a church that was diverse in many ways but stayed unified around Christ, that's what Jesus was praying for in John 17. In that moment, he's praying like, God, Father, you know, it's all about their unity. Everything hinges on that. If they hang on to that, then their community and their fellowship will be all it's called to be. And if they hang on to that, the world can change. And it did. It changed the world. And Jesus prays that for us today because I believe that it can change our world too. I mean, just imagine. Imagine what our world would be like. Imagine what our community would be like if every Christian actually did this. If we were able to engage in respectful and loving dialogue with people we disagreed with here in the church and people outside the world in the church who don't see things the way we do. You know, the kind of dialogue where we really listen to each other and try to understand, not just like we're biding our time so that we can throw in the sound bite, we can boom, you know, I can claim a win here, right? Not trying to beat the other person down with our views, not saying things about other people on Facebook that we would never in a million years say to their face if they were looking at us, Right? What if we were really listening and trying to understand? What if we really tried to identify the common ground we have? Because we almost always have it with people and use that as a way to have a conversation about moving forward. What do you think it would look like if Christians actually did what James commands us to do in his letter? Where he says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Where do you see that lived out in our world today? Not on TV. Not in the debates, not in the political ads or the approaches of pretty much anybody who is running for anything. No, their approach is the opposite. It says you should be quick to talk, slow, slow to listen, and get angry just as fast as you possibly can so that you can make sure you win. But if we did that, can't you imagine that sooner or later people would realize, wow, there's something different about these people. They're doing that with each other even though they're very different from each other. What could be going on there? That could change things. And that, that may seem a little bit idealistic, but I know it's true because I've seen it happen. Uh, many of you know that before we moved back to the States, Martha and I lived and worked in Santiago, Chile for a number of years after we got married. And during that time, we served in a local church there that Martha's parents founded that was just really unique in Chile uh, in one way. Um, what you need to know about Chile, Chilean society is very, very class conscious and it is very politically divided. In fact, if you follow world news, right, in the last year, there have been all sorts of protests and things like that in Chile that really sort of panned out along party lines and along class lines. So it's a very fractured country. And for the most part in Chile, classes don't mix and political parties don't mix. And that's unfortunately even true in the church there, which again is the one place where that shouldn't matter, right? So you have churches that are more upper class and churches that are more lower class. You have churches that lean left and churches that lean right. But the church Martha's parents uh, started, the Iglesia de Cristo Metropolitana, was very different, right? So you had some people in the church who were very poor, and they worked and served and worshipped alongside people who ran banks and worked for Fortune 500 companies. And you had people all across the political spectrum there. And, and Chile's political history is it's just really interesting. So um, 1970, uh, Chilean people freely elected a socialist president, Salvador Allende. He came to power in this coalition of kind of communist and socialist groups. So he was in charge for a few years, and then in 1973, the military staged a coup, so Pinochet took him out of power. Pinochet was an incredibly right-wing person, too. So while he was in charge, a number of the people who had supported Allende, they fled the country. Now, by the time that Martha and I moved there around the year 2000, uh, Pinochet had been out of power for about 10 years. A lot of those exiles had come back, but it's still a very, very divided country politically. But over the decades that Martha's parents worked there, they, they just reached out to everybody that they met. And the result of that is that people from very, very different places on the political spectrum encountered Jesus in such a way that their hearts were radically transformed, and they came together in this church. So it was just interesting. It's one of the only places in Chile you could go and you would see this kind of diversity. So just an example of that. So one of the pastors at the church was a guy named Santiago Avalos. This is a picture of Santiago there. So Santiago, uh, when he was a younger man, was a militant communist. Okay, so he, when Pinochet was in power, he was so opposed to Pinochet that he would use violence to fight back against that. Now, by the time I met him, he had kind of, he'd met Jesus and he had left the violence in the past, but Santiago was still very far to the left politically of anything you will ever see in this country. I guarantee that. 
And again, we throw out words like, oh, Bernie's a democratic socialist and socialism. This is not what we're talking about, okay? Like, this is Santiago. Santiago is so far to the left that, okay, let's hear the example. So we were, Martha and I, we were in Chile during the 2000 election with Bush and Gore, right? You know, so there's like two or three weeks where the courts are weighing in, and it's like, oh, is it Bush, is it Gore, and the hanging chads, what's going to happen? And there's all this sort of rigmarole about that. So we're talking to people like Santiago, and he's like, I don't see what all the fuss is about. What you guys don't understand is that Bush y Gore los dos son ultra derechista. Right? They are both ultra right wing candidates. Right? From his perspective, there is no difference between the two of them, and they are so far to the right, you can't even imagine that. Right? So that's Santiago, that's his political perspective. Well, so you see him on a Sunday morning, and then you look over one row and you meet this guy, Alonso Rutia, who's the guy in the back there on the right. Um, do you know what Alonso's job was before he um, retired? He was one of Pinochet's bodyguards. Okay, so he appreciated Pinochet. He felt like he had saved his beloved country. Alonso is an incredibly right-wing person to this day, right? Jesus has transformed his heart, hadn't transformed the way that the guy votes. But these two guys come together in the church and they work together and oftentimes they serve together, particularly in ministries to marriage. And their example of being united in what they shared in common with Christ in spite of some pretty marked political differences was just astounding. Like when people would come to the church or when they would come to marriage retreats and they would see these guys both there and hear their stories, they would be like, whoa, 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 how are these guys in the same room without killing each other? What on earth do they have in common? How, how are they finding common ground and getting together? And that, of course, would lead to an opportunity to share about the one thing they had in common, right? The one thing that we all need, which is the grace of our King, Jesus. See, Jesus knew that our unity matters, he knew that if we as Christians, if we allow ourselves to be divided, it would damage our fellowship and it would damage our ability to live out this mission in the world. So again, let's go back to where we started, right? Like our preferred candidate, whoever God has led you to, to believe that to be, our preferred candidate is going to win or lose in November based on how millions of Americans vote. But the reputation of Jesus will win or lose on what you and I do every single day between now and then. And we need to remember, right, whoever wins, God is in control, and that's who we put our trust and faith in. That's actually something we're going to talk about next week uh, in this series. But we've got to remember, if we allow fear, or if we allow anything else to divide us from other believers, it is Jesus' kingdom that is going to suffer. And friends, that is too important to lose. So the question that I think we need to wrestle with is, why would we trade that for anything? Right? Why would we trade our effectiveness in mission and what God has called us to do for anything? Why would we trade our unity and our fellowship for getting the last word? Or making sure that we drive our point home in a conversation? Or leaving a conversation feeling like we're right? That just seems like a really, really dumb trade to make. I mean, we might feel like we're winning in the short term. But Jesus says that ultimately it is his kingdom, a kingdom, by the way, that is going to outlast every political party, every candidate, every platform. It is his kingdom that is ultimately going to suffer if we decide to trade this away. So this is what I want to challenge us to do. Uh, this week in particular, but really every day between now and the election, I just want to challenge you to pray for what Jesus prayed for. I mean, it, it's an interesting thing to stop about, right? Jesus felt like this was so important. It was the last thing he prayed for. How often do we Pray for the things that Jesus prayed for. So I just want to encourage us to pray for this, right? Pray that God's spirit would help us stay unified in spite of our differences so that our fellowship can be all that it's called to be and so that our witness to the world can be what it's called to be. So here's actually a prayer that I want to encourage you to pray. And I think we typed it out in the bulletin so that you can take it home with you, right? But it's really simple. It just says, Heavenly Father, make us one so that we can introduce many to you. Okay, Heavenly Father, make us one so that we can introduce many to you. And I just want to challenge you to take time to pray this prayer every day. Uh, write it down on a post-it note or something. Stick it on your bathroom mirror in the morning or the dashboard of your car, somewhere that you will see it and remember to pray it. And, and pray that each day between now and the election, pray that truth will impact how we love each other and how God leads us to love the world around us every day of our lives. In fact, to end, this is what I want you to do. I want to invite you guys to stand. And in just a moment, I'll, I'll do a, a brief prayer, and then we're going to sing a final song together. But before we do that, I want you to stand up, and I want us to pray this prayer out loud together. We're just going to get some practice reps in so that we'll be ready when we start doing this every day between now and the election, okay? So I just want to invite you to pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, make us one so that we can introduce many to you. 
Let's do that one more time and then I'll pray for us. Heavenly Father, make us one so that we can introduce many to you. Let's pray. God, thank you. Um, thank you for the opportunity that we have to be reminded that we don't have anything to be afraid of. That yeah, stakes are high, issues are important, those things are true, Lord, but we do not have to fear because we serve the king and you are in charge. So God, would you help us be people who pray for and are committed to and who work for the very thing that meant so much to you, the unity of your church. That God, you would help us seek to understand each other even if we don't vote like each other or you just can't even imagine why anybody who calls themselves a Christian could be there on that position. God, would you help us to understand? Would you help us to stay unified around you for the sake of the world, for the sake of your mission in your kingdom? God, that is a prayer that you prayed right before you left, and I am convinced that if we pray it, you stand ready to answer that prayer for us today. So Lord, we ask that in your name. Amen.